Today we are concluding our sermon series on the seven churches of Revelation. We've been on a journey now for nine weeks and we're concluding with the final church, the last church, Laodicea. And I've entitled the message Laodicea, Lukewarm Church. And I'm going to take a reading from Revelation chapter 3, verse 14 to 22 out of the New American Standard Bible. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, The Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, says this, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed and I self to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. He who overcomes I will grant him to sit down with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's pray together. Father, as we come to look at this final church, we pray that you would be with us and that you'd help us to understand the message to Laodicea and also to us at this time. We ask all this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Are you familiar with Hans Christian Andersen's story about the emperor's new clothes? It begins, Many, many years ago lived an emperor who thought so much of new clothes that he spent all his money in order to obtain them. His only ambition was to be always well-dressed. He did not care for his soldiers, and the theatre did not amuse him. The only thing, in fact, he thought anything of was to drive out and show a new suit of clothes. He had a coat for every hour of the day. Can you believe that? Now one day two swindlers came into the city who declared that they could manufacture the finest cloth to be imagined. Not only were the colors and patterns exceptionally beautiful, but clothes made of their material possessed the unique and wonderful quality of being invisible to any man who was unfit for his office or unpardonably stupid. Well, of course, the emperor had to have such a suit. And so when the day came and he put on this non-existent outfit, nobody was willing to admit that they saw nothing until a little child who had neither possession nor ego to protect finally told the truth. He has nothing on at all. Whereupon the people finally were free to recognize what they already knew all along. And they joined in the cry. But you know what? Even when exposed, the emperor and his officers continued to pretend for the sake of their dignity. Now the people in Laodicea responded to Jesus' message the way the emperor did when Jesus told the church there, you are naked, you have nothing on at all. The city of Laodicea was extremely wealthy. 
Of course, it was destroyed by a terrible earthquake in AD 60. But you know what? They received no help from the Roman Empire. Nero, in fact, offered financial help, but the city declared that it had plenty of money to rebuild on its own. The two chief articles of trade in Laodicea were a glossy black woolen cloth and a special eye sulf, products for which Laodicea was known throughout the world. In fact, Jesus referred to this fact in Revelation 3.18. Also, the most famous hot springs of Hierapolis were near Laodicea. But the water that flowed into the city, by the time it got there, it was lukewarm and it was unpleasant in taste. A young pastor once asked an old pastor, why is it that new Christians create problems in the church? And the older pastor replied, they don't create problems, they reveal them. The problems have always been there, but we've gotten so used to them. New Christians are like children in the home. They tell the truth about things. The Lord was about to tell the church at Laodicea the truth about its spiritual condition. Unfortunately, they would not believe his diagnosis. They were blind to their own needs and unwilling to face the truth. The great commentator on the Bible, William Barclay, says of the church in Laodicea, and I quote, Laodicea has the grim distinction of being the only church of which the risen Christ has nothing good to say. Can you believe that? Laodicea, the church at Laodicea, faced the dangerous possibility of no longer being useful to the Lord of the church. He warned in verse 16, and I read it out of the NIV, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. The church of Laodicea was about to become a spiritual castaway. Although it was not lacking materially, it was useless as a spiritual body. Once a thriving church, now it was on the fence, useless to Jesus and the world around it. To the church in this condition, the vision of Christ is extremely important. He is the Amen, verse 14. The word of affirmation that I believe or that's right. So Jesus Christ is the answer, the affirmation of God. He is also, according to verse 14, the faithful and true witness to all that he is and does and says. He is not on the fence. He neither exaggerates or minimizes. He is absolutely true. And this is, of course, how we are to be. Added to these expressions is the fact that Christ is, according to verse 14, the beginning of the creation of God. He is the first cause. All things are the result of his power. He is the source of life and divine energy. So the Christ who is so envisioned has something to say to the church. And since this is the last church, let us think about this letter from two perspectives. Firstly, it has a special message for the church today. Laodicea illustrates for us the plan of God for the church. God's plan and purpose for the church is to be on fire, zealous and accomplishing Christ's goals. And this is what Laodicea weren't doing. Their efforts were half-hearted. Laodicea describes the peril of a church coming to a point spiritually that it is no longer useful to Jesus Christ. Notice with me the description of the verse, of the church rather. In verses 15 to 17, it had lost three Ps. It had lost its purpose, it had lost its perspective, it had lost its power. 
Laodicea had lost its purpose. It had little or nothing to live for in a relationship to Christ. The church illustrates the three types of people in every church. The spiritually hot, the spiritually cold, and the spiritually lukewarm. The third type is neutral, indecisive, and on the fence. They have no enthusiasm. They have no driving purpose. They are unmoved. They are unconcerned. I think this describes millions of Christians today. Laodicea had lost its perspective. They said they were rich and therefore had no need of nothing. But Jesus said to them, they are spiritually ignorant. Verse 17, wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. What a deplorable condition. How deceived we can become. Friends, the threat to the church was wealth, which made them more independent and proud. Yes, the pleasures of this world, money, security, material possessions can be dangerous because their temporary satisfaction, their temporary satisfaction makes us indifferent to God's offer of lasting satisfaction. And so if you find yourself indifferent to church, to God, to the Bible, you have begun to shut God out of your life. The evil of becoming self-sufficient can happen to any life or any church. We truly need the Lord. Laodicea had lost its power. The power of the church is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He is its fullness. But at Laodicea, notice verse 20, Christ was on the outside of the church, knocking and seeking to enter. How does a church or an individual turn Christ away? I want you to notice that it, it isn't done all at once. It's done gradually, step by step, until one day he begins to deal with the offender in judgment. God's purpose in discipline is not to punish, but to bring people back to him. Are you lukewarm in your devotion to God? God may discipline you to help you out of your uncaring attitude, but he uses only loving discipline. You can avoid God's discipline. How? By drawing near to him again through confession, through service, through worship, and through studying his word. The Spirit can reignite our zeal for God when we allow him, you see, to work in our hearts. Secondly, it has a special message of hope for the church. It has a special message of hope for the church. Hope for the church is found on, in, in, in several factors. I call it Christ's six C's. Counsel, compassion, chastening, commands, coming, conquering. Let's look at those quickly. Christ's counsel, verse 18. Buy from me gold refined by fire. Identify yourself with Christ in a vital, tested and victorious faith. White garments. Christ's clothing for believers is pure and holy. Anoint your eyes. The Holy Spirit anoints our eyes to see the things of God. So we have Christ's counsel in verse 18, Christ's compassion in verse 19. I love means that Christ still loves the church. What hope is that? He still loves us today. Amen. Christ's chastening, verse 19. I will reprove and discipline. Jesus disciplines the church by instruction, warning and correction, just as loving parents do to their children. Christ commands, verse 19, Be zealous. Shake off your complacency. Be enthusiastic and earnest. Burn with zeal. Repent. 
which means change your mind, your attitude and your life. Then Christ's coming in verse 20, I will come into him. If we want Jesus, he will come in. But I want you to notice that he never goes where he's not wanted or invited. His coming here is for fellowship. It's not talking about his second coming. To dine in verse 20 refers to the meal that families enjoy when they spend time together. And this is what the church needs. Time with the Lord Jesus Christ so that we can get to know him more intimately. And then the last um, C is Christ conquering. Verse 21, he who overcomes means that the church, that's the people of God, are to be victorious. He gives the privilege of sitting with him on his throne now and for eternity. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the Prince of Preachers, once said the following, and I quote, No scripture ever wears out. The epistle to the church of Laodicea is not an old letter, which may be put into the waste basket and be forgotten. Upon its page still glows the words, He that had an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. End of quote. Friends, I want to conclude with application and uses. Of course, the Puritans called it uses, their application. The message of the Lord Jesus Christ to his church then and to us now is a special message of readiness for his return. The Laodicean church was not prepared for the coming of the bridegroom for his bride. Just as Christ wanted the Laodiceans to get off the fence, so he wants us to get off the fence today. Instead of being dull, insensitive, complacent, Christ calls his church to be alive, awake and alert. Be ready to welcome him. And so, as we come to the close of this sermon series, Remember that the letters to the seven churches are God's x-rays given to us that we might examine our own lives and ministries. At the end of each letter to these churches, the believers were urged to listen and take heart what was written to them. Although a different message was addressed to each church, all the messages contain warnings and principles for everyone. Which letter speaks most directly to our church, KPC? Which has the greatest bearing on your own spiritual condition at this time? How will you respond? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for what we have learned through this series. It's been incredible divine insight into the reality of life in the church throughout all history. Seven actual towns and actual churches that we can trace through all of human history, even today. And again, Lord, we say to you that it's our desire to be like Smyrna and Philadelphia. Faithful, perhaps faithful through persecution. Faithful like Smyrna to suffer persecution and not deny you. Faithful like Philadelphia to keep the door to the kingdom open all the time and be a church that has the door wide open to usher people into your glorious kingdom. Keep our church faithful as long as history runs, until Jesus comes. Keep this church faithful. May it never be that a letter like this to the church in Laodicea or any of the other letters of warning and judgment would ever be written to us. Sustain your work for your glory in this place. In the name of Jesus, the faithful and true witness, we pray and ask this. Amen.